Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Amy Horst, and I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Director here at the Arts Center. Uh, I've seen quite a few of you throughout the day at our various conversations, um, but there are many of you that are new, so welcome. Uh, I would especially like to thank all the members and donors of the Arts Center for making this programming possible. First and foremost, the Lenore Tawney Foundation, many of the board members are here, um, for not only their investment in this project, but also for their guidance. Our thanks also for the support provided by Kohler Foundation, uh, for the Kohler Trust for Arts and Education, the Frederick Cornell Kohler Charitable Trust, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the University of Chicago Press, Sargento Foods, and the Hertzfeld Foundation for their contributions to this evening. Um, before we really uh, get started and the panel shares their insights into developing this project, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the origins of the exchange. Our relationship began in 2006 with Lenore Tawney, when then senior curator Leslie Umberger spotted a carved wooden angel in the background of a portrait of Tawney from the late 50s in Craft Horizons magazine. At that time, Umberger was researching the work of artist Albert Zahn, known as the Birdman. Zahn had transformed his entire home with, in Bailey's Harbor, Wisconsin, uh, into an art environment by covering it with his carved and painted bird forms. Uh, in addition, he made ships, swirly gigs, a little <laughs> bit of furniture, and uh, specific and significant to this conversation, he also made angels. Umberger wrote to Tawny, suspecting that the angel in the photo was created by Zahn. Kathleen Nugent Mangan was there to answer Umberger's email and indicated that Tawny, nearly 50 years after that portrait had, had been taken, not only still had, but continued to cherish the wooden angel. So for those of you who uh, haven't been uh, in the conversations earlier today, Kathleen curated Tawny's 1990 retrospective at the American Craft Museum and continued to work with the artist as a freelance curator and as a member of the Lenore G. Tawny Foundation uh, Board of Directors and eventually became their first and um, only executive director. Uh, so Kathleen uh, arranged an uh, invitation to see the piece uh, because up to that point, Tawny actually had no idea who, uh, who the maker of the angel was. And um, uh, Umberger uh, did confirm that it was a Zahn and instantly upon walking into Tawny's studio space, began drawing connections between Tawny's studio and the artist built environments such as Zahn's that were in the Art Center's permanent collection because Tawny had very little separation between her making and her life. Our connection with the Tawny Foundation continued over the years. Um, in fact, I was told that the first gift that the foundation made after Tawny's um, death was the gift of that Zahn Angel um, to the Arts Center. Um, in 2016, um, after quite some time from that original conversation, a press release was issued by the Art Center announcing the purchase of property to build the long-awaited Art Preserve, a permanent facility dedicated to artists who transform their homes, yards, or other spaces into multifaceted works of art. Upon seeing the re release, Kathleen reached out to Karen Patterson to re-engage the conversation around Tawny's studio environment. Uh, and let me also mention that Karen um, at that point was uh, the Art Center senior curator, and she is now uh, the curator at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia. So Karen came to me with an incredible sense of urgency and unwavering conviction <laughs> that we should not only continue the conversation around Tawny's environment, um, but that the Art Center should undertake an organizational-wide exploration of Tawny. Um, and I will admit in public that I was hesitant at first. <laughs> uh, we were in the thick of designing and planning the Art Preserve and just about to launch our 50th anniversary celebration, which included an extensive year-long exhibi collaborative exhibition series, a new publication, and a conference. And I was not at first convinced that we had the capacity or that it was the right time to focus on a singular artist. However, we arranged a visit to the Tawny Foundation offices to discuss further. And I have to tell you that the very moment 
that we walked through the doors and were surrounded by Tani's furniture, collections, personal effects, and archives, I completely understood Karen's convictions. As Kathleen showed us image after image of Tani's incredible pieces, and she opened all of the drawers <laughs> and let us see the immense treasures that laid inside, handmade clothing, these incredible collections of inspiration for, for, for new pieces, um, works by other artists finally curated um, and placed around her space. Um, it became very clear to me that exploring this work in the context of the Art Center's collection and research would not only expand our notion of artist-built environments, um, it would also provide an opportunity to fully explore Tawny's interconnected life and work. And I finally understood that sense of urgency that I felt in Karen's proposals. I was flooded with that exact same sense of urgency. So we got to work. We recognized that the undertaking would take an incredible team. Um, and so with Tawny's archive as a resource, Karen and Kathleen brought Dr. Mary Savig, um, curator of manuscripts at the Smithsonian Archive of American Art, into the conversation. With a desire to explore Tawny's impact, Shannon Stratton, who at the time was chief curator of the Museum of Art and Design and now serves as an independent curator, as well as our interim senior curator, um, which was brought to the table. Uh, Dr. Glenn Adamson, a senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art, as well as an independent curator and writer, was invited to undertake extensive biographical research on Tawny, uh, a project that he was actually considering on his own, um, and he was thrilled to, I hope, <laughs> to join forces with this incredible team. And last but not least, Dr. Florica Zaharia, uh, Conservator Emerita of the Metropolitan Museum of Art was invited to explore the technical prowess of Tawny's work. So this panel is meant to share the intimate connection that everyone has felt with Lenore Tawny's work in developing the project. Um, as such, each person will ask the next a question. Um, so I'd like to kick us off by asking Karen a question. So Karen, in those kind of early moments of engaging with the work and starting to explore it, what was that thing, what was going through your mind mm -hmm. that really gave you and brought such a sense of urgency and such strong convictions around this being the thing we must, as, as you guys say, go all in mm -hmm. on? Um, oh, I think the urgency and the desire to go all in was just a reflection of Lenore Tani's um, desire to go all in. And so there was no halfway to go <laughs> because the more you saw and the more that Kathleen showed me, the more I, f I felt like this was going to be a project that was going to change my life and was going to make me think differently about the world. It was going to help me slow down. I certainly have the privilege as a curator to think of projects, work with artists that can teach me something. And um, Lenore was an excellent teacher. She continues to be that. Um, and what she's taught me was something that I wanted to spend time on. And that was, um, which was so great to hear the artist panel talk. All those things that the artists were talking about with mystery and what is the structure and what is the, what is the form or this idea of words and thoughts and taking care. Um, all those things were things that I would know that I would learn from Lenore, and I just couldn't wait. And then, of course, there's <laughs> the all-in of Kathleen, and um, she's very convincing. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we, I asked her this week, um, did you know the first time that we met that we were that this project, we were gonna do this project, and she said yes, yeah. and I felt the same way. <laughs> it was just a matter of who who was gonna play with us and who was gonna be there with us to um, learn and to share this knowledge in a very. And what I love about this is that it feels very personal, but it doesn't feel cheesy in that way. Like I feel like a deeper understanding of very obviously art making, but just how people move through the world and how people can embed a sense of spiritual self in their own life and um, that's why I went all in and I don't I have no regrets <laughs> um, but I also uh, just want to go back to Kathleen because um, she, she, when we walked into the office 
so gracious and so invested mm -hmm. and um, the way that she talked about Lenore as if you know I didn't I knew I knew enough about Lenore but I didn't know everything of course and I still don't know everything um, but the way that Kathleen talks about Lenore um, is so intimate and thoughtful and and informed um, you just can't you just can't not do this project but she also has this role as being uh, the curator of her work. So it was different to curate Lenore's work because she's passed away and we can think about concepts and we can think carefully about arrangement and work and, 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 and kind of where we put this next to this. And, but you had the privilege of working with Lenore on exhibitions. And so I guess that leads me to my question. Um, we all know that artists have their own preferences when it comes to curating the show. And so I'd love to hear from you. Um, what did Lenore insist upon, and what did she like about not your show, but generally? Like I also want to know what your show, but like what uh, generally exhibitions? What was important for her, and um, and what were some of her stressors? I guess. So I think uh, that one of the things that was most important to Lenore is that she considered herself to be an artist, not necessarily a weaver even though weaving was what she was most widely known for. But she worked, as we've discussed earlier, in other media. She worked in two-dimensional work, she worked in three-dimensional work. And all of these things had equal importance to Lenore as she looked at her body of work. And she viewed them very much to be part of the same thing. So I think when you see the works in the gallery, you see that they're in constant dialogue with each other. And this might be a little six inch square work on paper, or it might be a nine foot square weaving that we are very privileged to have here in the same sight line. But you'll see that her exploring this iconography and this kind of repeated uh, combination of sources and images and things that were important to her. And it was very important to Lenore that those be considered together as a full body of work. And that certainly had not always been the case when her work was shown. So I think to have the opportunity here to show the work together, to show it as a full body of work in the way that Lenore would have wanted it to be seen is a wonderful opportunity. And I think the other thing is, in terms of her woven work, for which she certainly is most widely known, it was really important to Lenore, um, as Florica spoke earlier, that from her very earliest works, uh, that the works come off of the wall, that they be exhibited in space. She considered them to be sculptures, and they're shown that way here as well. So I think we have the privilege to see Lenore's life's work here in the way that she would have wanted it to be seen, which is just, a, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And so as Karen said, Mary was an early part of this project. Mary and I, uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with Mary on other projects prior to this. This one is certainly the most in depth. And as Mary came, and oh, I should also say that Mary's exhibition uh, combines papers from the Archives of American Art as well as from the Tony Foundation's archives. That's the first time we worked together in that way. And Mary came and spent quite a bit of time in our papers in the office. And so I guess my questions for Mary are, first of all, how do you think, it's a kind of a two-part question, how do you think uh, Lenore's papers reflect her as part of a certain moment in the studio craft uh, movement, um, as a friend, as a, an artist that, you know, in terms of the relationships, the intersections of her papers with other papers in the archives. And the second thing is, because Lenore's papers are a bit unusual, how, what do they require of you in terms of how to, how to work with them? Well, thank you both for bringing me onto this project. So at the Archives of American Art, which maybe some of you have never heard of before, we're in Washington, D.C., 
Um, we have about 6,000 collections. So those are other archival collections created by artists, curators, institutions, uh, dealers, collectives, uh, ranging from the 18th century to the contemporary. So I've seen a lot of artist papers <laughs> and um, studio craft papers are, um, you know, they're, they're a lot like a lot of artist papers with documenting work, tracking project files, commission files, exhibition records, sales records, really standard archival material that researchers find really valuable. And also sort of the structure, underlying structure of works of art, like sketchbooks um, and also networks. What's a little unusual about studio craft uh, papers is they tend to focus a lot more on um, workshops and uh, non-traditional schools like Penland and Haystack, so you see a different side, and also a lot more on the duration and process, a lot of things that artists today were talking about on the panel. So um, there was there are really great connections between Lynn Ortani's papers and the archives that we were really excited to uncover, and Glenn did a lot of that work too. If you look at his footnotes, they really map out pretty much everything in the archive that mentions <laughs> Lenore Tani um, and beyond. So it was, you know, we knew she was part of this really interesting network. People um, often like to point to the Quente slip circle, but also within these circles that were people would, that would have been at Penland, that she would have traveled with. So the Toshiko Takeit, so papers who we have, we have some whose papers we have, we have really interesting correspondence and connections. Um, also, we just got the papers of a weaver in New Mexico named Alice Kagawa Parrot that includes some really beautiful collage work. So everywhere you go, there's just these connections keep um, expanding this network of people in really exciting and unexpected ways often that poses new questions about uh, Lenore's, um, her sense of humor between people. I think what's really exciting about her papers <coughs> is you know, in her work, we all talk about her otherworldliness and her spirituality and her meditation and how serious she was. But in her papers, you really see this very clever, humorous, and often the very silly side of her, where there are a lot of puns and visual images, visual jokes, and really personal, um, just uh, person to person inside jokes that. But they're very enigmatic to people who are trying to understand what she's saying, and sometimes it's meant to be. Um, but it is really, they are very personal. So um, that's what makes her papers really special, and also just the way she made them is also really extraordinary. Um, she doesn't have a lot of things like project files or commission files. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, instead, as she was making her art, she was making her archives. So she was often cutting up some of her correspondence and layering it into her artist books. She received, a, as Glenn mentioned earlier, she received a lot of handmade correspondence from people who were trying to return the beauty of her gifts to them. And uh, so that she received a lot of like feathers in the mail and shells and some of the really nice ones are in the exhibition and buttons. Um, and a lot of it she took and she repurposed into other projects. So. Uh, you can see this way that she's she's both making her archive into art and she's really paying attention to it, not just to document the works that she would have had in a gallery or museum, but just because it was so integrated into her studio practice. So on that note, um, it, I did hear a lot of similar things in the artist panel about uh, artists who mentioned seeking and finding and looking at the world in a way where they can really incorporate it into their art. So I wanted to ask Shannon first just to where the <laughs> title of the exhibition came from mm -hmm. and how I, I kind of have an idea of where it came from. So and how, um, how looking at her archives and having a better sense of her personal life and this deep intimacy that she had with other people um, shaped, if and how it shaped the way that you curated this exhibition? Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, the title of the show is even Thread Has a Speech, and the has is in uh, parentheses. 
Um, because the original line is every thread had a speech and it's um, a line from a Theodore Rothke poem called Unfold Unfold um, which who is an author that uh, Lenore was very fond of reading and referencing um, in her own work and there's a piece by Lenore called even thread had a speech um, that we couldn't borrow for the show it said MoMA um, but it brings together a lot of uh, many, many aspects of Lenore's practice into one object. It's an assemblage sculpture, a small uh, um, sculpture object. Uh, that object has collage elements in it. Um, some of the collage element is text. And, and then there's, um, there's a kind of thread or fiber that is um, much like the plexiglass pieces is sort of pulled between uh, two points in the uh, in this box so it sort of meets in the middle and radiates out from this kind of center point so it's this um, it's this warp or it's this weaving without a um, weft necessarily but in a sense it is sort of woven into the text that's within the box so if you kind of look through it it looks like you can sort of see the text through it so there's this almost lenticular like image that it um, that it, quality that it has. So anyways, I, this object I think was interesting to me because it was many things about Lenore's practice in one object. Um, so it was a really um, kind of useful touchstone for the <laughs> exhibition where I was looking to draw out various kinds of um, threads <laughs> from <laughs> Lenore's practice <laughs> and draw them into like 2019. So um, I tried to go about the process of curating the show by thinking about what would, if you took this part of Lenore's work and stretched it, you know, into the present, what would it have become? So how might have she become more explicitly a performance artist if she had um, engaged in performance further than, than inviting or collaborating a dancer into her own work? Um, how might... Uh, thread as a drawing, um, form of drawing, sort of have expanded into, or that kind of unweaving of a textile have expanded into her work today. So that's what's happening with the, the choice of the artists in the exhibition, but I also felt like this was, these artists were in dialogue with Lenore, so it was a conversation, it was a kind of text that was being explored in objects. Um, and I think that that's the thing about the line that I love in the context of a poem called Unfold, Unfold, which is obviously had its own sort of textile-ishness to it, um, is this sense that um, thread, which has, uh, textiles have long had this kind of relationship to text. That is a theme that a lot of people who work in fiber often explore. Um, but that really simple line about even thread has a speech becomes, um, this is maybe seems a bit abstract, maybe it doesn't, but I thought a lot about the thread between, you know, like two cups when kids are playing the conversation, you know, that sort of telephone game and this idea of the, the thread as this, this communication that links together um, two parties. And so it's linking these artists to Lenore and her um, practice from a different generation into the present. So that's my poetic metaphor for the title of that show. Did I miss any part of your question there? No. <laughs> um, ramble on. Um, so um, my question for Glenn, um, well, it's a, there's a preamble because um, Glenn and I had lunch at a sushi restaurant together in New York, close to our uh, former place of employment where we worked together um, at the Museum of Arts and Design. And we were having a conversation about um, writing work that Glenn was embarking on, and he started to talk to me about how he wanted to start um, uh, focus on some bi um, some artist biographies. And this opened up into a conversation about his interest in writing about Lenore. So um, I hope many, or if not all of you, have read Glenn's writing, and you know um, him as a prolific and exciting writer who has really chronicled studio craft as well as design and as well as you know broadly contemporary art but I think for those of us who've come out of a craft background as artists or scholars or curators um, Glenn's writing has been a really important part of the field 
Um, but you hadn't written a biography, it's certainly not an extensive one before, maybe short biographies that are part of an exhibition catalog, but not this kind of a thing. Um, so this is a bit of a process question um, for you as a writer and a thinker. How did, a, a multi-part question, but how, why were you drawn to Lenore as somebody whose story you really wanted to tell? And how did taking this kind of deep dive into somebody's life um, unfold into a different kind of writing for you? Okay. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so uh, that's absolutely true. I had not done a biography before, although I had done several monographic projects, so one-person exhibitions with publications. But I guess I had an interest in writing a biography because I knew that it would be different and I didn't know how. And I suppose I'm echoing your point, Karen, that I was interested in working on Tawny because I thought it would change me somehow. And I guess by definition, you don't know what you're in for when you seek that out. Um, it also might just be worth stressing something that Amy said in the introduction, which is that I had conceived the idea to write a full-scale biography on Tawny, which I had imagined as a separate self-standing book, before I knew this, any of this was happening. And it, it's sort of like the the Albert Zahn angel, like some, somebody's watching over us, whether it's Tawny herself or otherwise, uh, to make all of this happen. So I had this um, kind of gulp-inducing phone call to make to Kathleen, who I didn't really know, to suggest to her that not she, but I should be Tawny's authorized biographer, <laughs> despite the fact that she knew absolutely everything and I knew very little. Um, and similarly, I had this incredible experience of welcome and invitation. And I think in the first conversation, you let me know about the Kohler project, and we hope that it would sort of there would be a confluence, and that's what's happened, of course. So uh, the reason that I had thought about Tawny was partly very specific, which is that I had just finished an exhibition about Peter Volkus, which had been at MAD, uh, my last project at MAD, really, and then had gone to the Renwick Gallery. And Volkus and Tawny, this is not an original thought with me, Volkus and Tawny have often been considered to be pendants in the formation of the post-war studio craft movement. Volkus in ceramics, he's the great breakthrough figure, the great avant-gardiste who rewrote the rules of the discipline by knowing them so well that it, he could perform magic with them. And similarly for Tawny in textiles. So there's a kind of natural um, diptych there. Uh, but also, I kind of wanted to recover from Volkus's extreme machismo, <laughs> and Tawny seemed pretty well cast in that role. I very much wanted to work on a female artist also, and learn something about textiles. So there were lots of reasons, um, but of course there's always the more, most fundamental one, which is that you think you can live that long with somebody in their work, and Tawny just seemed that she would have that kind of space to inhabit and that I would want to be there for as long as it would take. And I guess that gets to the other part of your question, Shannon, which is what is it, what's different about writing a biography from writing other forms of art criticism and art history, including monographic exhibitions that you might do about an artist living or dead. And I think for me, the answer became that you can go all the way down or inside the person's head if you want which is quite a frightening ethical position to be in. So if you're assigning yourself the responsibility of telling somebody else's story in its totality, and I know every biographer struggles with this, you have to invent what you think your own personal guidelines are, and not only as to what's important, but what's appropriate. And the degree of speculation that you might bring to the artist and their motivations and define for yourself what you think an, uh, a ver your version of respect for that person would be. And so there, there are little things like how much should I read into her works when she didn't necessarily say what they were meant to mean always. Um, she was, of course, a great wordsmith, so there was a lot to use, but it's also very tempting to say for example, there, there's a work called Triune, which is actually not in the show, but it's in the Metropolitan Museum, that has a very bold white cross in the middle of it. And uh, it suggests ecclesiastical tapestry, which was common at that date, but to me it also suggests the union of warp and weft, so a kind of macrocosmic version of what that very object and everything else she was making is composed of. And that's not necessarily authorized by Tawny's own words, 
but that's the kind of thing that I wrestled with. You know, do you bring that to the work or not? In a way that actually an art critic might just let fly. A biographer, I think, has more of a sense of um, territorialism to, to consider. And then there are also personal questions. So one uh, obvious example of that is that there's been a lot of speculation about the nature of Tawny's relationship with Agnes Martin. And, um, you know, ranging from what is their professional relationship and influence to personal relationship. Some people have alleged that they were romantically involved. I don't have a lot of, um, I don't lay a lot of credibility on that claim, but there's also a question of how you even talk about an issue like that. Is it any of your business? Why would you even want to put it in print? Um, and I know a lot of biographers, again, um, wrestle with that. So you can read the book and see what I did. But, um, <laughs> but uh, gift shops that way. But, uh, but maybe that leads me to the last point that I wanted to make, which is just that what I discovered was that writing a biography about Tawny was not just like writing a biography about anyone. And I'm sure every biographer feels this about their subject. There, there are specific things about that person that change the craft of biography writing through the force of their will and example. And in the case of Tawny, for me, it was that supremely continuous, undifferentiated, and unified relationship between her personality and her work, which you see so beautifully embodied in the show because all the work in the gallery, as you'll see, the main gallery, is orbiting around and almost pervading the studio space where she spent all that time. It's a metaphor of her psychological domain, I suppose, as well as her professional domain. And so, you know, she, she on the one hand, seemed to invite that kind of all inness, as you have been saying. But on the other hand, so much of what she was about was silence and the power of the unspoken. And if you think about it, the power of her woven forms is actually all in their negative space. It's what's not there that makes them so radical. And the shapedness of their not thereness, and similarly for her open work weavings. So, you know, it, it's, it's almost like she made me reflect on the rights. Uh, and motivations that I had myself as somebody writing about another person and the way that I might be able to use that same kind of negative space in the writing, you know, what you pass over um, maybe as speaking volumes in some way. And that's a lesson I'm still trying to learn more deeply and apply to my other work. Uh, so on that note, I wanted to ask you, Florica, to sort of talk about the same thing we've all been talking about, which is how Tawny has changed you. And of course, like Kathleen, you knew her very well. And you have this extremely um, distinguished career as a textile conservator. And so what I'm wondering is what does knowing Tawny and what does knowing Tawny's work, uh, what has it changed for you when you look at other textiles? So when you handle a tapestry, a historical tapestry or another 20th century work, how do you look at it differently because of what Tawny has taught you through her example? Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's very um, interesting to hear all of you uh, talking and saying, talking about your experiences. And here I'm thinking how lucky I am because I'm a technical person. I don't have to speculate. I don't have to think what was in Lenormand. I just have to look at her work and make sure I know the structure and I know how the weaving or, or any other um, textile technique uh, must have been done. And from that point of view, I can demystify Lenore's work. Uh, being among Lenore's friends, it also helped because I often have a conversation with her about how she have done certain things, how she arrived to 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 her uh, to putting her vision into into the real work. Um, it helps me also a little bit um, the fact that originally I am an artist, a tapestry weaver and designer. So, uh, and then later I became a conservator. So the mixture of, of, um, of this really helped me understand uh, Tony a little bit better. Um, well, I, I have looked in my life in in a thousand a thousand of textiles from from various culture or worldwide, and uh, interestingly about some of those textiles, I have a conversation with Lenore. Uh, a group of pieces that I have 
often talk to her and I even have a dream once and I, I, I have a uh, chat with Lenore about it, are the dynastic linens, Egyptian linens. I don't know why Lenore, well, I should know why, but anyway, it's a little bit of, a, of the mysterious thoughts around it. Um, having the chance to work with these very delicate pieces and perfectly woven pieces, I always, the early work of Lenore remind me and must have been no a connection, connection there. And relating to Lenore, my dream about uh, uh, masses of Egyptian linen being lying down in the lab and whatever it happens, she said, well, that's not a surprise. I was very much looking at some point at this kind of textile and she, she in her, um, intentionally or not, they were part of her thinking a part of her creation, probably, uh, um, Kathleen, you you are aware of that. Uh, so um, you you're you're connecting automatically. Um, sure, you're you're looking at her later, the North uh, later work when it's very solid, structurally very solid, the woven form and and uh, um, especially and all that warp face weaving which are dense. Uh, yet she's bringing the light into it, but then you you relate that with other textile that that you see it, and you learn to you learn to to find um, um, to look at the at the method at the technique that she used that it's different from other from other pieces. For instance, I was talking earlier about. Um, uh, the bride, for example, but not only there in Dove, we see that when she weave those slits, long slits, it's very difficult to to control the length of it and to make them all of them evenly, and it's very difficult to make the selvages um, uh, woven beautifully uh, and smooth. And she knows. I mean, the classic weaving: you take a shuttle and go from left to right, and you're coming back, and you will having that gap because the weft is is moving. Well, for the weavers, it must be easier to understand. But I wish I had a drawing to. So, so you will have a thicker, thicker point in one side, and when you're coming back with the weft in the other, you will have a thicker point on that, and the gap in the opposite. Um, and Lenore doesn't want that. She wants to have a perfect weaving. So what she's doing, she's using two shuttles and going from one, uh, and she's crossing it over, and she brings the weft in the same shed, so she increases the thickness. Now, I'm, th I'm looking at the, at the pieces in the collection, and I'm thinking, oh, do I find something like this? And it's not easy to find something like that. It's really amazing. So um, from that perspective, le really, Lenore taught me a lot. Um, again, looking at nativity in nature, it was the first time when I saw uh, Lenore's work, the piece that is now at the Interchurch Center uh, in uh, New York City. And uh, I encourage you to go to see it. It's on view, permanent view. And it's an incredible, an incredible piece that Lenore came, came, came up with a combination of techniques, combination of materials, giving topography, a special topography to, 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 to the piece, controlling it in a such a way the composition of it being done in a horizontal loom and being done in three widths and yet to match the design and to make it flow from one panel to another is really amazing. Um, for me it was a total surprise uh, because you have this very, very um, <laughs> opposite um, way of weaving the background and the figures. You have an open weave on the background, which is almost like a cheesecloth, <laughs> well, kind of speaking. And, uh, and you have the heaviness of the weaving with a floating thick material that goes over, over it. For me, it was um, a, a very inspiring at that moment. For me as an artist, because I was closer at beginning of the 90s, I, I was still an artist, I was still doing a weaving. And um, uh, in Inspire, and I, I, I even started weaving in a smaller scale, something that to play, to try to play with the topography, with a, with a um, 
uh, various density of weaving. So um, yes, you're going back to the historic pieces and you're trying to, to uh, relate to that. But um, uh, she's pretty unique in her creation, so yeah. Thank you. Um, that it's worth noting that um, this became a very personal project for a lot of people, all from different um, vantage points. It was also, there were a lot of surprises along the way, um, and so I thought we would ask ourselves, each other, <laughs> this question. Um, what were some of the surprises for you in your own vantage point and in your projects that, um, that you'd like to share today? Why don't you start? Okay. <laughs> See? So convincing. <laughs> um, Kathleen, I would say um, I would say what what surprised me was how uh, how under my skin it got, and that was surprising to me to hear you talk, Glenn. It's the same thing. It became it did, it wasn't away from me. It was it was definitely in me, and. Um, and that was a surprise, especially as Amy said, there was a lot of big projects going on at the Art Center at the time. And so it surprised me that I still would turn to this project every once in a while just to kind of like, and that's kind of, and it just feels that way when you see her work. And so how, how connected her life was to her work, looking at her studio, it all just started clicking in this really, really, really deep, resonating way. And so then there was no, there was no denying it. And so I think that was surprising to me mm -hmm. that it got under my skin. Yeah. So I might have thought that I couldn't be surprised anymore because I've been working with this collection for a very long time, but that's just exactly the point. Um, as some of you know, I, I started, I went to Lenore's studio first in 1987, although I had probably met her once or twice before then uh, at the American Craft Museum. I certainly didn't know her well until that point. I began to work on her retrospective exhibition that opened in 1990, and I continued with to work with her until she passed away in 2007. And since then, I've been working with the collection through the foundation. So I've been working with the collection that you're going to see this evening for 32 years. And what surprised me about working on this project is that I'm still learning new things about these works. And I'm still coming to understand them in new ways, and I'm still getting surprised by things that Lenore did and things that are in the works. So I think of it almost like peeling away layers of an onion and getting closer in. And this project has definitely helped me do that. And I was very surprised at some of the new things I learned about the work and about Lenore through working on this project. And that's just been a great delight. I um, so I read artists' correspondence and their diaries for my job, so it's really hard for me to be surprised. <laughs> I feel like I've read I've read everything, um, and that's so. <laughs> um, well, not in a way. What what was a challenge for me that surprised me was. Often there is such a directness through artist papers um, when you can sort of see a formulation of their ideas. And I feel with Lenore Tani's papers, the more you look at them, the more opaque some parts of her life become. Mm -hmm. And you really just can't really get deeper. I mean, it's so, the work itself is so deep, her journal entries and the way that she's meditating on and pulling together in text and through her her collage and her weavings so many different sources that are um, spiritual and really intellectual, but still like getting to try to really decode that is nearly impossible. So with this project, um, actually Glenn did most of it, so I was able to just sit back and really not think about trying to parse something that I might normally do for an archival project, but really just think and dwell in these common motifs of her work through her archives, like water and stones and earth and birds and cats, because cats were very <laughs> important to her. <laughs> that only the archive, actually that's the surprise, only the archives reveal her love of cats. You will not find that in the, uh, her other works. So that's, that's the lesson I came away with. Um, 
but yeah, just this way of um, thinking through archives in a different way to see an artist's work because thinking, seeing through the archives is almost like seeing through her work where it's it really entangles you and pushes you to think differently, but it doesn't actually solve anything. <laughs> and, um, that's a really that was a really great part of the process. Um, hmm, surprise. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's totally a surprise, but it maybe it's more of a, well, I don't know. Um, I think for me, curating a contemporary show through a historic artist is, it's like trying to see contemporary art through the practice or through a, a, somebody else's practice. Or NC field that I'm very close to. I studied fiber um, while I don't make work anymore. It's so it's so all of that like close and very close. You know, everything feels very close and very personal. Um, but I guess in to some degree, I think there's a objective side of me who was like, "That's great. This is mm, pair this artist with this work from Lenore's practice, and these things are interesting in conversation." And uh, it seemed very strategic or sort of structural and. But I think what surprised me is actually um, when the work got installed and they were in, that the show was really in conversation um, with Tani, particularly with the Cloud Labyrinth, as you pass through that into the gallery. Um, just how much she kind of, she truly does haunt the work of the artists that are in the show. and. You can plan a show and think about it and, you know, think that you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and still put it up and be like, wow, that, wow, that's true. Then, and I think that I was, I was like surprised that it, it really felt, it like feels that way. Um, and I think you have to be careful calling things beautiful in the art world sometimes, but that it's a, it's a beautiful, that resonance. Um, and, and that feeling was surprising. I was pretty surprised that she made a postcard making fun of Henry Kissinger as a panda bear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, was, I was also quite surprised to find that her cat Pansy, uh, to your point, Mary, that her cat Pansy actually merited a full-scale obituary in the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> so the, I, it's the only time in my career I've given a cat a footnote. It's quite a long footnote. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, I think today was an incredible surprise walking into the gallery, and you're about to get to do this, and it's going to be amazing for you. Um, and the, of course, it's always surprising to see work when you've only seen it in person. I had seen some Tawny works in person, obviously, during the research, but uh, by no means uh, all of them or even a majority. And one of the things that every curator always says is that even when you know the dimensions of a work, and then especially if you don't, which in the, this case I didn't always, the issue of scale is always a, a huge surprise. It's sort of like, you know, I've been saying that today for me is like a thousand Christmases rolled into one. And um, it's, but it's, it's almost more than that because it's like you open the box and then the work is larger than the box was in your brain. And particularly with Tawny, would you, you all know that uh, film Powers of Ten by Charles and Ray Eames where it starts at a picnic blanket and then it backs up to the scale of a galaxy and then it goes back and it goes into the person's hand and then you're down at the atomic level and it comes back again? Great film. It's on YouTube, Powers of Ten. Um, and the shows like that, like you feel like the tiny, tiny works are already, you know, cosmic and you feel like the big works are just these in some ways, for all of the time that she put into them, they were very, very lightly tossed off in a funny way. They had this kind of gleeful pleasure inscribed into them that's quite similar to her postcards, you know? So she's able to somehow operate at all these scales simultaneously. And that was something I never had understood until I walked into that room and saw all of that work at once in one space. It's really powerful. Um, continue what you're saying in a way uh, at two level one it's about Lenore second cat or maybe third cat <laughs> called Angel 
So the angel with a very orangish yellow hero um, um, body was sitting in the middle of the table during our Friday night dinners, a <laughs> uh, time uh, when Lenore and I, we will talk about uh, many things, but most of the time about her creations. And one of my questions to Lenore um, was repeatedly, how did you come up with the design? Did you have it on the on on the cartoon? Did you did you, you project it somehow? And for some, especially for the early work, she did. But but for most of the pieces, she would say no. It will just come out from the inside, and I will sit on the loom and I will not give up until I finished. So it was mentioned earlier in the discussion we have today that. Um, uh, sure, weaving in a horizontal loom, uh, lengths of fabric, you will have to roll it on the front somewhere so you can continue the weaving. How can you control the 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 image that so the the composition that you want to to have it for a particular piece? And the surprise for me uh, today, I mean, I have seen I have seen a bit of uh, quite a bit of Lenore's work, but not everything. And uh, the surprise was to see some of her work that has a bottom to ceiling uh, uh, length, and they're so well controlled, incredible. The composition is perfect, and the weaving and the color combination, nothing nothing it fell off. And how was she able to do that? I, I still uh, have a hard time of understanding, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I just want to take this minute, this time to thank all these collaborators for such an amazing project. It is stunning, and it has been such a pleasure to work with you. And I'm so excited to share these um, galleries with you all, and I think that's where we're heading. So thank you. So thank you. please thank um,